Good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are and which part of the planet. My name is Orizi Saltis. I teach at Georgetown, and I am also involved as a principal in the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted Ostracized and Banned Art. The society was founded by Rachel Stern in 2014, and its point and its purpose is to make the world aware of artists, particularly but not necessarily visual artists, whose lives and whose art was significantly affected and or truncated by the events leading up to, during, and immediately after the Nazi era. So this afternoon slash this evening's program is an event that is part of our larger online project called Identity, Art, and Migration, in which we investigate immigration of European refugees to the United States leading into, during, and in the immediate aftermath of World War II through the specific lens of seven artists who form case studies for us. Annie Albers, Friedel Zubas, Eva Hesse, Rudi Lesser, Lily René, Arthur Chick, Chick, sorry, and Fritz Asher. But each one of these seven artists featured was affected in different ways by the Nazi policies. One of them, Fritz Asher himself, for whom the society, of course, is named, never managed to make it out of the country. So he went into a kind of internal migration and hiding for several years uh, in the basement of the apartment building in which a friend's mother resided, uh, right in the heart of the Grunewald on the edge of Berlin, where much of the Nazi brass had taken up residence. And five of the artists came from Germany, directly or indirectly, to this country, ranging from, at a very young age, Eva Hesse, not quite three years old, to much older, like Rudi Lesser, and everybody in between. And one of the seven artists, Arthur Schick, the subject of today's session, in fact, was from Poland and arrived here by way of a circuitous route, about which we'll hear more in a few moments, um, and made a spectacular success here in the United States. Schick was already known for his ornately detailed renderings of historical subjects and Jewish themes before he got here. After the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939, he gained all kinds of international audience for his biting caricatures of Nazi leaders and his efforts to garner support for the Allied cause and for Europe's persecuted Jews. And in 1940, he took that mighty pen, mightier than any sword, and eventually was able to bring it to the United States, where he quickly became a very popular artistic sensation. His stuff was in all kinds of magazines and newspapers, and it is said that the GIs all over the world, that for them, Schick images were more popular than pinups. We are really fortunate today to have two spectacular scholars sharing our virtual stage in discussing Schick. Stephen Luckhart is the senior program curator in the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum here in Washington, D.C. He served for 20 years as the curator of the museum's acclaimed permanent exhibition, The Holocaust, but in addition, he curated eight special exhibitions, including The Art and Politics of Arthur Schick and State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. Stephen has appeared on C-SPAN, CNN, NBC Nightly News, Associated Press, Reuters International, um, History Detectives, I love that one, Steve, the History Channel, Huffington Post, the list is too long for my mouth to encompass all of it or my mind. And so I'll simply cut to the chase. He got his PhD in modern European history from the State University of New York in Binghamton. And he has published on German history, the Holocaust, Nazi propaganda, among other things. And then we have Irvin Unger, a former pulpit rabbi and antiquarian bookseller whom I've known for years. And we met through Arthur Schick in a way, because that was the first topic that we shared in common. He's devoted the last quarter of a century to scholarship on Schick. He's curated and consulted for numerous Schick exhibitions, including the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the Deutsches Historisches Museum in Berlin, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Library of Congress, and the New York Historical Society. And Irvin Unger is also the author of Arthur Schick's Soldier in Art, which won the 2017 National Jewish Book Award. He's also the co-producer of the documentary film Soldier in Art, Arthur Schick, 
and the creator and publisher of the luxury limited edition of the Shik Haggadah, which is a magnificent work of art. He's also served as the curator of the Arthur Schick Society in Burlingham, California. Let me begin by saying that none of us is gonna be satisfied with the amount that we're able to squeeze into an hour. So all of you out there have as your assignment, you understand I'm a college professor, you have your assignment. And that is to look up the stuff that these two guys have written on Schick and then look beyond that. And by the way, come back later. And I mean by later in a few months when the Fritz Asher Society virtual exhibit is up and still later when all this becomes a book. So you've got multiple assignments. The final grade won't come in for at least a year, so you can relax about that part. And I will stop babbling. Stephen, please, the floor is yours. Share a screen and do whatever else you want to do with us. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Amari, for that wonderful, uh, pre for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's great to be here among uh, old friends, although, I, when I say that, I don't mean in terms of age, but because we're all fairly young, but it's just a, it's just remarkable to be here with all of you. And um, Irvin, it's, it's great to see you and uh, to, uh, to, part, to partake of this program with you. Now, when Ori and Rachel mentioned the idea of a book and a, um, a program dealing with uh, migration, art, and identity. I was intrigued by this. And I was even more intrigued when they asked me to contribute an essay on, on Arthur Schick. And in some ways, you know, I started looking over the, the just the remarkable number of artists that came to the United States during the 1930s and 40s. I mean, you think about people like George Gross and Max Ernst, you know, from Germany, or you've got Marc Chagall, you've got, you know, um, uh, Jacques Lipschitz, uh, um, Pete Mondrian, and, uh, and many others who came to the United States and built careers here. And I started thinking, well, how does Schick fit into this? And in many ways, Schick uh, differed from uh, many of the others, and that Schick came to the United States with a distinct purpose that um, he was not actually fleeing the Nazis. He came here to fight the Nazis and to, and to ensure that the Nazis uh, would not gain a foothold in the new world. Now, uh, this of course is, a, is an interesting topic in itself. And, and uh, here I wanna show you a picture of the cartoon crusader with Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady uh, at the time. And this is a picture that was taken uh, in February of 1941, not, not that long after Schick got to the United States. And it shows him autographing uh, a sheet of poster stamps that he did for the British American Ambulance Corps as a fundraising uh, effort to provide ambulances for the British Army uh, during fighting against the Nazis. And this has showed one aspect of his, his artistic crusade. He was called the, the cartoon crusader in- Steve, are you, gonna, are you gonna share a screen? Oh, sorry, I thought I was. No, Wait a minute. thank you. Wait a minute. And stay as close to the mic as you can because occasionally your voice seems to drop out okay, a little. Wait a minute. Let me... Let me get back into this. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. Now let's see how this works. Uh, this was the photograph that I was talking about that was taken in February of, of 1941, shortly after Schick came to the United States. And it shows him with with Eleanor Roosevelt and Bula, and you can see that he's autographing a sheet of poster stamps that he designed for the British American uh, Ambulance Corps. And these, uh, this was one part of his life in the United States to do these kind of fundraising activities for organizations that he, that he supported, and we'll look at some others that he did. But Schick was born in Poland, born in Łódź. Uh, in 1894 and was schooled in, in France and uh, later built a career in France illustrating books and then did, 
did, did a lot of work on the, the Haggadah in England and in Poland later. And he was in Pol he was in England when the war broke out in, in September 1939. But already before that, Schick had made a concerted effort to strike back at the Nazis, using his Haggadah as one of those artistic weapons to do so. And then when the then and he did relatively few cartoons in that time period, but those that he did were attacking the Nazis. Once he once the, the war broke out, he devoted a lot of his attention to doing caricatures and um, and to uh, and cartoons aimed at calling attention to Nazi actions in in his native Poland where his mother and his brother and his wife's family still lived under German occupation, and to call, uh, call attention to the struggles that Poles had against Nazi Germany, and, and also to raise awareness about what was happening to the Jews. And this was something that, of course, was very important to him. Now, when, when the, uh, in, in 1940, particularly after the fall of France, in June of 1940 and the Nazi conquest of much of Western Europe, Schick became concerned uh, about the spread of Nazism. That he believed very much that uh, in that, um, that, the, that the world was in danger from Nazism. And in June of 1940, he, put, he actually wrote to the both the Ministry of Information in Great Britain, the, Britain's propaganda agency, as well as the Polish government in exile, requesting support for a, a plan that he had to come to, uh, particularly the United States, to win support for the Allied cause. And he outlined that in a June 1940 document where he talked about his plan to come to the United States to uh, open up an exhibition showing his Haggadah and other works, his anti-Nazi works, and to reach out to win over American Jews to the cause. He believed very strongly that, uh, that American Jews were supporting the government and, and, that, and, and, ice, and that, that the country had become, uh, become very isolationist. But he also believed that the allies really weren't doing enough to, um, to aid the Jews or call attention to what was happening. Well, shortly thereafter, Schick does go to Canada. And we don't know how much support he got from the, either the Polish government or, uh, or the British government, but he did come as, let's say, an unofficial representative. And uh, he arrived first in Canada, along with a kind of a, uh, on a ship that housed a number of uh, European intellectuals who accompanied the United States also to win, a, win over American support for the, uh, for the Allied cause against uh, Nazi Germany. And this is one of the pieces that he did in Canada that calls attention to the threat that Nazism posed. It's called The Painter and the Clipper, and it was a, a piece that he did in, in Ottawa. And it shows Hitler as this kind of failed painter painting Europe all black and you see the skull and crossbones sim signifying death that he's painting all over Europe and you see that it's the lone Great Britain that's about to cut the scaffolding that's there uh, and and aiming to destroy Hitler's plan for world conquest but if you notice the way that Schick has framed this artwork you see both Canada and the, you see the new world there. So it's clear that Schick is aiming to show that this is a threat to the new world, that, that you need to prevent Nazism from striking in the new world. Well, he comes eventually in December of 1940, comes to the United States. He starts working for, um, does some uh, illustration cartoons for PM, uh, kind of a left-wing liberal newspaper. But in the, that summer, he, a book of his wartime caricatures is published and called The New Order. And this is one of those, print, this is one uh, page from that book. And it's called A Madman's Dream. And it's a very interesting piece in many ways, which I don't think we can see all the details 
of this. But again, it shows, I was intrigued by this particular piece in a number of ways uh, because of the, the amount of detail in it and what I think Schick was getting at. Now, I don't know if you can see on the, it, it captures this notion of Hitler's dream of world conquest, this madman's dream. And in the back on this throne that Hitler's sitting at, you see this in German, it says, I am the Holy Ghost, or I'm the Holy Spirit. And this is a reference to the New Testament book of John and the Act of, of the Apostles, referring to Pentecost, where you have this, where Jesus has told his disciples that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost will reappear and come to him, and that he will um, speak to the disciples, and they will be able to speak in different languages and go all over the world. So in the way you have this kind of Yashik portraying this twisted image drawn from this, and so you have, you know, representatives of Vichy France, you have the Jap uh, Japanese militarists there, you have Mussolini there, and then you have this, this image of both a Uncle Sam and a John Bull who are enchained, enslaved, uh, who are essentially begging for mercy from this new overlord. And below it, you see under the feet of the, the Axis powers, you see this representation of, of a Jew, and it says, perish the subhuman. So this is part of this of Hitler's dream to eradicate Jewry. So in this one image, Schick is conveying a lot of the things that he outlined in his, his program to win support for the Allies, to, to uh, talk about the threat that Nazism uh, represented to the New World, but also to call attention to what was happening to the Jews in Europe and the Nazi effort to exterminate uh, European Jewry. This is an, uh, another kind of a remarkable piece that Schick did in that in 1941, in which he shows uh, Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, and you, with Charles Lindbergh. Now, this followed in the wake of uh, Lindbergh's Des Moines speech of September 11, 1941, in which Lindbergh uh, argued that the uh, that there were three, three, call, three groups that were pushing the United States into war, the British government, the Roosevelt administration, and the Jews. And this caused a, st a storm of controversy. At the time, Lindbergh was not only a recognized American hero as an aviator across the Atlantic, but he was also head of America, the America First Committee, the premier uh, isolationist organization in the, in the United States. But here Schick is playing up his ties to the Nazis and accusing Lindbergh of being a Nazi stooge, a fifth columnist. And this was some, a concern that Schick had. Uh, and I think in some ways it was quite remarkable. When I think back on, on Schick's career, he hadn't been in the United States that long, but he was willing to take the risk of attacking prominent American figures and, and accuse them of supporting Nazism or being fifth columnists, which is, is quite remarkable. You think about a figure like George Gross, who in Germany during the 1920s had earned a reputation for spewing uh, Junkers and, and German politicians. When he came to the United States, he didn't do that with American figures. Most of the artists that, that came to the United States in that wave of, of, of immigration in the 1930s and 40s held back from criticizing American figures and calling attention to uh, American social problems and evils, but not Schick. This, and this says something about Schick as, a, as, a, as an artist, as a human being, that Schick was never one of those people that was my country right or wrong. Wherever he lived, he wasn't afraid of, of criticizing behavior or attitudes or policies that he felt were wrong. Here he took, a, he attacked Gerald, Senator Gerald Nye from North Dakota. Nye had in that summer of 1941, 
1941, had attacked the, the Hollywood, saying that Hollywood was no longer producing uh, entertainment, but was producing war propaganda to get the United States into war. And in that nigh uh, brought up, emphasized the Jewish owners, the Jewish film owners, you know, the Louis B. Mayers, the Adolf Zukors, the, the, the Warner Brothers, and all the, call, particularly calling attention to them, you know, and bringing up that while they have access to, you know, all these theaters around the, the country to push their message, he, uh, others opposing them have been, you know, denied access into assemblies, et cetera, assembly halls, etc. And so Schick took aim at Nye, and you see that he's carrying this book, Sein Kampf, a kind of parody on Hitler's Mein Kampf. And you see that he's peddling the protocols of the elders of Zion and other not, and the not leading Nazi newspaper. So through the efforts of people like Schick and, and Dr. Seuss, they kind of discredited many of these the, uh, people like Lindbergh and Nye who are peddling uh, anti-Semitism and isolationism in, in the United States. Uh, and here is an, another aspect of, of this kind of uh, calling attention to what he saw as a, as a problem in the United States. And this was something he did in the summer of 1943. And this is a, a cartoon that says, looking for Hitler's summer offensive, it's right here in the USA. And it shows Goebbels reading uh, about riot, race riots in the United States, strikes, et cetera. Now, that summer was a very, uh, uh, there were a number of uh, very, um, there were race riots in Detroit and various other places. Even in Harlem, there were, there were some major riots there in that summer. There was the Zoot Suit riot in, uh, in Los Angeles that summer in which you had thousands of American servicemen attacking Mexican-Americans. In, in Detroit, you had, you had mob violence between African-American and uh, white crowds. In, the, in Harlem, you had an incident where uh, a white policeman shot a, a, an African-American MP resulting in looting and rioting that went on. Now, what Schick is getting at here is that who are the beneficiaries of all this, this kind of hatred and dissension? It's the Nazis. And of course, the Nazis and the Japanese were quick to, to bring up these incidents in their propaganda to say, oh, well, look at these hypocrites. They talk about, you know, the United States talks about the four freedoms, et cetera, but they don't treat their own minorities that way. And so Schick is calling to attention to it. And, and also, if you look at his artwork, it is, he's presenting images of showing unity of Jews, of African-Americans, of, of everyone working together to fight against Nazism and fighting for democracy. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of close with some of these images that show Schick's efforts to call attention and to aid the Jews in Europe. He felt very strong. He still identified very strongly as a Polish Jew did a lot of work for the American Federation of Polish Jews. But one of the things that I'm always struck by Schick's portrayals of, of Jews under German occupation, you can see that it shows them wearing the white armband here, which was required in the, in the General Gouvernement in, in German-occupied Poland. But what Schick did is he shows Jews the nobility of the Jewish victims. That is, he, there is something, there's something, he never shows them as weak, that they're bearing their suffering. And they, and, and also, as we'll go to the next one, they also could be very, they can be heroic. And he, Schick was somebody who always wanted to call attention to Jewish strength, whether that's through his representations or not. And I, I'm going to, 
I'm going to just conclude here, but I want you to talk about the, the importance of Schick as both an artist who is willing to use his tools to support democracy, to call attention to what was happening to the plight of Europe's Jews, to use this as, as a potent weapon for, uh, in favor of democracy and human rights. So let me stop there. Stephen, thank you so very, very much for that incredibly interesting talk. I wanna remind our participants that if uh, issues or ideas occur to you, share them in the chat. That would be better than the Q&A, the chat, and we'll see what we can get to when we are finished. I turn now, cause we sure are not finished, to Irving Unger, uh, who will further enlighten us in the midst of this darkness. Terrific. So, uh, Steve, thanks for that. You know, it's great to reunite with you after working with you on the Schick exhibition in 2002 at the uh, Holocaust Museum, and also Ori to, uh, to have this chance to share the screen with you and uh, to go back to our days, early days, uh, well, probably a couple of decades ago when we, we, first, uh, we first met. Um, I've actually uh, selected uh, six works of art. Uh, I'm going to approach Schick from a, a different pr perspective than Steve, but all with the same uh, ultimately objective. And uh, I've, I've selected these six works of art, um, again, as a follow-up and, and also to be used um, prior to our dialogue and uh, discussion with, with Uri. Um, all of the artworks um, uh, that I'm going to show draw on the inspiration that uh, Arthur Schick derived from two very basic uh, biblical and uh, rabbinic principles, uh, respectively. Um, these are principles which I actually believe were at the foundation of his, uh, his character and uh, at his core, and uh, which ultimately shaped uh, who he was. Namely, uh, the first of those two principles is from the, from the Torah, from the last book, uh, from Deuteronomy, um, in which it states, uh, you must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers uh, in the land of Egypt. And the second principle uh, that I think deeply influenced Arthur Schick was that of the first uh, century sage Hillel, where he said, um, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, uh, what am I? Um, I would like you uh, to try to keep these two statements in mind as you view the art which follows. Um, artwork that was created by a Jew from Poland when he was a stranger in France, a stranger in England, and an immigrant um, in the United States, um, and how he used his uh, personal experiences um, as a Jew, and how he turned to the history of his own people uh, to champion the cause of the oppressed and the persecuted, and uh, of course, the strangers um, that were in his midst. So I'm going to explicate the following six images, and if you can try to keep those couple statements in mind and who Schick was at his core, and you'll begin to understand even more about what the, the brilliance of his artwork is, uh, is, uh, is showing us. I'm actually going to begin here with one of my favorite Arthur Schick works of art. It's a historic poker game. It's probably my favorite work of art because my father used to be a poker player and a, a point of personal privilege, my father actually won the World Series of Poker actually, or I bet you didn't know this in 1997. So dad would have loved this. He died a number of years ago and I never really got to talk about this in his presence. But here what you have is um, after the invasion of um, of the Soviet Union by Germany and breaking the pact in June of 1941, Schick uh, creates this historic poker game because he really sees the situation as a, as a, uh, a contest between uh, Hitler of Germany and Ivan of Russia. Now, uh, Steve made reference to John Bull and Uncle Sam of England and America. Uh, the caricature of Russia would be Ivan here. This is not Stalin who's facing uh, Hitler at the table. And what is taking place here in this game is that there's a standoff between the two countries and Hitler uh, is holding in his hand three jokers, three wild cards. This, this is uh, Mussolini of Italy, Patan of the Vichy French and Hirohito of Japan. And Ivan is holding in his hand a pair of aces. This is Great Britain and America because America was supporting those 
those were their, America's allies at the time with uh, war materials and gold to, to, to booster them up. But Schick here in this image is betting, has more chips, as you will note, in front of the Russians than he has in front of Hitler, in, in front of the Russian than he has in front of Hitler. Why is this? Because Schick believes that a pair of aces are strong and solid and that Joker's wild cards, no one knows what they're going to do. So Schick is betting here on Ivan of Russia, while all the time death looks on in the upper right because death will come out on top unaffected by the war while Hitler, you know, has tattered pants and so on, they will be in battle while he, on strings, he carries along his acolyte nations as puppets uh, to his cause. Now this work fascinated me. It, on the right, you can see it became the, the, he drew this in September of 1941 and uh, two months later, it appeared as Schick's first cover uh, on the front of Collier's Magazine, one of eight covers, which he did, that he were illustrating those covers while Rockwell was, uh, of course, illustrating the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. For me, this, is, uh, this gives you an idea of what this, uh, what this new Jewish immigrant was willing to, to produce for the American public. Now, while this is significant for me, what is even more significant, quite frankly, is that piece of paper which appeared inside of this magazine and would fall out as you opened its cover. And this is the piece of paper that appeared within this magazine. And what was it? It was a Schick statement uh, to the American people that, that how proud he was as an immigrant, as an immigrant to America, to create this kind of artwork for the American people, saying to them, you, you really don't know what a privilege it is. For me, as an American, as, a, as an immigrant, to, to share this artwork with the American people. My son is fighting for the free French under the Gaul in North Africa. And, and here I am having the opportunity uh, to state why this war is so important for the democracy of the Western world. And again, he concludes with, this is a real privilege. Um, Schick addressing himself, a stranger in a new land who's willing to, 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 to come to the cause of those who are now within, within his midst. Um, I would like to fast forward for a moment to an American piece, which is at the end of the war, and then I'm gonna go back a bit because I want to, to drive home this message of here you have um, in our own day where we talk so much about uh, immigrants. And while we're keeping in mind the great messages of Schick's art and the great genius of the art itself, but the context of who he was and where he was, as Steve actually uh, uh, intimated it in his presentation. Here you see the visual history of America. This is Schick's sort of fabric as he sees it of the essence of the United States in 1945. What is it? It's great crea creativity of the steamship, in, uh, uh, of the locomotive in the bottom right, the steamship in the bottom left. The great cities of America contribute to its fabric. That is the, uh, New York City in the middle left, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco in the middle right, the upper left, the Hoover Dam, the, 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 the construction that we see here, and also the people who contribute to the greatness of America. You'll see in, in the lower left, again, the, the American sailor, the white American sailor, the soldier, the white American soldier, but Schick reserves here in this piece equal space, as you'll notice, for the black man, for the African-American, and for the Native American, saying as an immigrant to America that these people have as much to say and have as much a role in the fabric of America. I love this piece because it is saying to us even today, if you had to draw a picture of the United States of America, what would you include? Would you agree? Would you disagree with Schick? How would you present America today? And this is what Schick is willing to do in his early days here as, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a newly arrived um, artist with the message on America's shores. By the way, he did become an American citizen in 1948, which is something which he stated in that, that, that piece of paper that came out from the Colors Magazine. I hope someday to become an American citizen, um, loving America as he did at the time, but also willing to be stand up to its injustices where he saw them, again, something that Steve referred to. I wanna go back a second because I wanna show the origins of his 
interest in, in, in other minorities and other people who might be oppressed or persecuted. But going back as early as 1930, when he was in Paris and he created a whole history of the United States even before he had ever visited America, his Washington and his Time series, 38 paintings of George Washington and the American Revolution. And I might state here that he has more versions of a portrait of, of George Washington in this portfolio than did Gilbert Stuart, the great American uh, historical portrait, uh, portraitist. I hope I got that right. Got in any case, Perfect. In any case, I want to take, I took this one piece from the series to again show you that here in the Battle on Concord Bridge, Schick chooses to put in the very forefront of this, the, the, the fellow dressed with the pink garb, a black man, Prince Estabrook or Easterbrook, who's fighting on behalf of the, of the new country at a time when this black man himself is not even free. And Schick in Paris, a Jew from Poland, is emphasizing the role of a black man in the American Revolution, even before he's ever come to this country. And so you begin to see from his earliest days how Schick is sensitive to the plight of all of those who make up the greatness of, of, a, of, of a democracy, ultimately a democracy, a democracy in progress, uh, even as we might even say in our own day. Um, Again, now moving from a stranger in Paris to a stranger in England. And here, Schick creates a series called the Polish American Fraternity Series. There, these are 23 um, paintings that were exhibited in 1939 at the Polish Pavilion and were on exhibition when, when the Second World War broke out. And while each of these works of art uh, demonstrate the contributions that Poles made to the United States, which was important to show uh, to Schick as a Pole, and Schick loved Poland. He didn't like its anti-Semitism, but he felt himself as a Polish nationalist. Of course, sure, he loved, you know, Israel, land of his people, and America, the land of his dreams. But here, he was emphasizing the, the a connection between Poland and America on the eve of World War II, and how he. Uh, wanted to emphasize the contributions of Poles to America. Here in this, in this image of Tadeusz Kosciuszko, who is, was a military figure, and you can see that by his military dress, almost in every image where Schick has a military figure in the upper left-hand corner or in the background, he'll have a military or a battle scene, but not in this case. And why is that? Because he wanted to emphasize something else. And what is it? It is this document that Kosciuszko, who, who went on to become a brigadier general under in the Continental Army, um, who was maybe the was also the uh, head of artillery. Uh, he was an architect. And in fact, this is West Point here, which uh, most of its fortifications uh, are attributed to at Kosciuszko. Schick wants to emphasize what's in his hand. And what is this document? This is Kosciuszko's last will and testament. What does it say? in? In 1798, when Kosciuszko is going to return to Europe for a second and final time, it's his last will and testament states that I have earned almost $15,000 in the service of the, of the American people in its fight in, it, in the American Revolution. And I want to give this money to you, Thomas Jefferson, because I want you to take this money and with it, I want you to purchase the emancipation of all of your slaves and give them freedom and liberty in my name. Wow. This is Schick in 1938, recalling an event 140 years earlier for the peoples in his own day about freedom and emancipation with the idea that I would be sitting here today with Uri and with Steve and able to take this historic message and event and bring it into our own time because it's something which applies even our own day. And this is the genius of Schick's art. It cuts across the generations, it cuts across the events, and it brings history into our own time. Again, by a stranger in a strange land advocating for a peoples that are part of the, the fabric, as he sees it, of, uh, of, of mankind. And here, coming to World War II, where he is now in America, he, he arrives here, as Steve mentioned, in the end of 1940. And here, while he embraced and he loved America, he was willing to stand up to where he saw it was wrong. And he was willing to, you know, in a sense, speaking truth to power. And here he's, again, uh, during the war, uh, 
the 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 the, the uh, military units were segregated. Blacks and whites could not serve together. And Sheer 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 Schick is attacking that that racial humiliation, that racial divide, by showing a a white GI and a black GI walking side by side with captured Germans uh, to the left. And Schick's caption on this is where the white GI says to the black GI, tell me, what would you do with Hitler? And the black GI responds, I would make him a Negro and drop him somewhere in the USA. And that is how great racism was in America. That would be the greatest punishment in a sense that you could give to Hitler by making him a black man and shit calling attention to that great hatred of mankind. And Schick was a hater of hate and he hated to see that sort of thing. And here he's calling it out for the American public. And even though the American military called him a citizen soldier of the free world, even though he was embraced by the American public, Schick at the same time was willing to stand up to the American military by creating such a work of art. And my last work of art to share with you is De Profundis. Again, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? De profundis, the Latin phrase for Psalm 130, out of the depths, I call to you, O Lord, for my suffering. And Schick ha has shows us here Jewish suffering while Jews are clutching the, the Torah scroll. And while Jesus is painted with the Jewish people here in the upper left, holding the Ten Commandments, but most likely the com most common bridge between the Judeo-Christian tradition of the going back the, the Ten Commandments, as if to say, were Jesus alive in 1943, when Schick drew this work of art, he too would have been killed as a Jew. I have maintained now for years that this is not only Schick's single most important work dealing with the Holocaust, but in my opinion, this is the single most important work created on paper during the, during the, during the Holocaust itself. Because not only like uh, Chagall and, 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 and Picasso, who through Guernica and white crucifixion documented human tragedy, Schick documents human tragedy, but goes one step beyond. And how is that the case? Because by calling upon this biblical phrase, Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Schick is calling for accountability. Who is responsible for this? Who brought this about? And what is important to remember about this, and by the way, in the Sea of Cain, Schick paints a swastika. In the A of Abel, Schick paints a star of David. And almost every single work of art, in fact, every work of art that I've shown you, Schick created for the purpose of reproduction. And if this work was reproduced, where did it appear? It appeared full page in the Chicago Sun in February of 1943, given the caption of the living voice of the dead. Who put this in the newspaper? Was, the, was this the owner of the Chicago Sun? No. Was it the editor of the Chicago Sun? No. Which Jewish group paid for this? No Jewish group paid for this. It was a Christian group that paid for Shiksar to appear full page, like a page of the New York Times in size, where ha the top half was Schick's art. It was a Christian group. How do we know that? Because this is the text underneath. This was the Protestant Textbook Commission. The Protestant Digest, part of the Protestant movement, paid for this. What did they say? They said because of the anti-Semitic statements that have been in our textbooks over the decades and the seeds of anti-Semitism that we have sown through the millennium we have to take responsibility for this because not only, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, they are saying that not only is this anti-Semitic and not only is this anti-American, but it's anti-Christian itself. And this is how Arthur Schick's art was used during the war years. This was reproduced um, in numerous magazines and journals during the war years. There were um, lectures and symposium that were held particularly in Forest Hills and Kew Gardens in, in, in New York uh, concerning this work of art and what Schick was doing and how Schick was calling, not only trying to document human tragedy, but to begin to think about uh, where the roots of this come from. 
but also in dialogue, also as part of what can we do beyond this? And this is the way in which Schick, as an immigrant to America who ultimately became an American citizen, told, tur turned his attention to the rescue of European Jews. He had two wars to fight, one against the Axis and one on behalf of the Jewish people. How he never had blinders on, but his, his, his mind, his essence, his being was concerned about all peoples that were in his midst. And this, to my mind, is the greatness of Arthur Schick. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And the third part of Hillel's statement is, if not now, when? Thank you so much, Irv. Wow. Um, uh, it's a shame we don't have another four hours or four weeks to continue. But I'm going to start with a, a, a comment that was batted back and forth in the chat uh, among three individuals, Anne Weiss, Linda Jimenez Glassman, and Rebecca Kaufman, that made the observation, beginning with Anne Weiss's observation, that no women were included in his fine depiction of the USA. So on the one hand, we've got someone who, and I love the comparison to Rockwell, which is this idealized, perfect white America, and Schick loves America, idealized it at the same time. I don't think you said it clearly enough, Irv, he was not afraid, I'm joking, was not afraid to lambaste America for its failures and racial prejudices were among them. Any comments about the lack of women? You go first, Irv, and then if you want to add in, Steve, please. I, I, I must say, Schick, correct, Schick was not in that portrait, um, in that painting, but, Schick, but women are all over the place in Schick's works of art. If you look at one of his great works during the year, Samson in the Ghetto, the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, you'll see a woman uh, fighter, sniper, who's, who's enclosed in that. You know, the first um, woman who was a member of the American cabinet, uh, uh, Frances Perkins under Roosevelt. Schick did a huge portrait of her for Fortune magazine, but he illustrated the books of Ruth, the books of Esther. Women are in his Haggadah. Um, he, he, he illustrated Deborah, uh, the judge, um, uh, and, and so on in his, in his artwork. So women were present. They aren't in this single work of art, but uh, suffice it to say, uh, it, women weren't everywhere, but Schick did not ignore their presence to Jewish security, um, their ability to, uh, to stand uh, side by side with uh, their fellow uh, men in, uh, in, in standing up for justice for both the Jew um, and primarily for the Jew, but also recognizing their contributions to American democracy. Great. Steve, anything to add? If not, no, I'm I'm to, to, okay. I'm then just I'll going go. to echo uh, what Irvin uh, said, because you, you have in, for instance, the Haggadah, you have this wonderful image of, of, um, of Judith in there, you know, and, and showing the heroism, and likewise, the book of Esther, you know, c conveys the heroism of Jewish women. You have in a lot of his wartime artwork, you know, the showing that Jewish women, Jewish children, Jewish men conveying the code, you know, are victims, all of right. them are victims of, of the Nazis. So I think, you know, I think Schick is a person of his times, but in some ways he was prog more progressive than many. And I, th I think, um, you know, uh, we had a, a fairly circumscribed series of directions in, in which to take his work in this brief hour, but to come back to something I said at the beginning, the assignment, Google Irving Unger, Google Stephen Luckert, you'll find bibliography referring to their work on Schick, where they have shown and written on these other works that, of course, were left out of today's discussion. I have um, a question for anyone. Um, it just occurred to me, Philip Roth's Plot Against America. Is either of you aware of whether or not Roth was familiar with Schick's work? Just It just occurs to me to wonder. Since it, you know, Plot Against America is about a what if, if Lindbergh ended up elected as president, and the United States moved in a more Nazi direction, as it very well could have, because he was a hero. Uh, any any thoughts? And it could be nah. I'm just curious. And Steve, you're muted. Just in case you want to say anything, you're muted at this moment. No, that was me who muted Steve because I wanted oh. to talk. No, I'm like... <laughs> any, any, any thoughts? No, I don't. I don't know if uh, 
if Roth was aware of Schick's work. It's possible. But I mean, it's also that there was a, an earlier uh, text that perhaps Roth, uh, Roth was familiar with. Um, uh, it can't happen here, you know, here by right. Sinclair Lewis, you know, which also posited the same type of right. premise. And that was done in the 1930s. Um, and so the, it wasn't, um, he, so I think what, what Roth did was built on this long tradition. Got it. Got it. I would just throw in here that everybody knew who Arthur Schick was, particularly during, during his lifetime. I afterwards, you know, it's hard to account for. But I, I was just reading something, uh, I think, yesterday, which I had never paid much attention to, how a, how a French ambassador to the United States went to the State Department to complain about the power of Schick's art with regard to attacking the Vichy in French. I mean, the Japanese knew about Arthur Schick's art because they took one of his works of art and they used it, which, which showed the frightening Japanese for the American soldiers, and they went and used it and dropped it as leaflets from one of their planes. The Japanese knew this, and this appeared in American newspapers where it showed the, how they repositioned Arthur Schick's art um, to use. The Germans certainly knew about him because there were reports that Hitler put a per personal price tag on his head. And if that's true or not true, we don't know, but the newspapers were writing about to show the power of his art. I mean, so I'm picking nations here, but the presidents of various countries, the kings and princes, every, and, and the GIs whom Steve mentioned, they carried in their flak jackets, you know, these caricatures and cartoons of Arthur Schick from the highest realms of society, to those who are the, the, among the, the common human being who's not of those official ranks, everyone knew who he was. I mean, you could so, not know who he was. So here's a question that uh, David Namorov asked in the chat. Are you aware of any works by Schick that were censored, and I presume he means here, as too controversial? Well, uh, I could jump right in on that. I Just yesterday, um, I was looking for a, well, I know that Chick's Antichrist, which shows Hitler with uh, skulls in his eyes, it's one of the most frightening pieces of probably the most iconic portrait of evil in the 20th century. You know, I'm always one to say Chick did the most important Holocaust work of art. I'm also the one to say that he did the most iconic work of art. But you're talking to me who loves Schick, but you should ver you should determine this on your own. I, that was supposed to be a cover of a dust jacket. Uh, I saw the dust jacket all came out. It was not Arthur Schick's. But the answer is, yes, he was censored. He was even censored in Hollywood, where he created a, a, a billboard for Mike Todd um, as the girls go. I forgot the title was. And he criticized the critics um, who would be criticizing the work of art in this billboard. And what they did is they painted over it. They left three or four of Schick's faces there, but they painted over it. So there are occasions where his artwork didn't make it out there, but the American press, I mean, the, he was, I mean, his, his, his work of art attacking the, the Ku Klux Klan um, for their, for their uh, uh, abuses of white supremacy. Those were printed in the newspaper in New York. Um, he made it. I mean, he was there. And, and if he wasn't, he was going to get there the next time. So the answer was, yes, he was suppressed at first. Look, he created a whole New Testament where he painted Jesus looking like a Jew. But that 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 commission was overturned because he made Jesus look too Jewish looking and he refused to change that. So and, and would one of you address, you know, earlier when he was still in Britain and he did this work, which in the, well, it was the Haggadah where he had all of the bad guys, as it were, the Egyptians, with swastikas, and the publisher got really cold feet about that. I'll say no more because I want one of you guys to address it. Steve, you want to take a shot at it? Yeah, that was something that you, uh, Schick had talked about painting swastikas on all the Egyptians, and uh, he removed those, covered those up, with the exception of one, which we discovered in the course of you know, the, the work we did in the art and politics of Arthur Schick, we were very curious about this. And so uh, we found that. And when, you know, you kind of wonder, did he do that intentionally or was that he just didn't miss that one? But it wasn't, the, if you look at the, this film, Cartoon Crusader, you see that his illustrations for the book of Job, he's, got, it's very clear he's got the swastikas in there. And then in the final version, those are covered up. And that happened, I think, uh, at least three times that I know of, you know, where you can see the remnants of where swastikas were and where they were removed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
And, but I'll leave the rest to Irvin. Go ahead. I'll, just, I'll just say one place where I think where he was censored, but I'm not sure whether he was censored or self-censored him, censored himself. In the Haggadah that Steve's uh, referring to, on the dedication page, which was the King George the Sixth of England, he says, uh, "At the feet of your most gracious Majesty, I humbly lay these works of my hands, shewing forth the afflictions of my people Israel." Well, I found two sources that he added three words to the end of that, which he painted over, which were the words "unaddressed" and "unavenged." And so this this dedication would have read, "At the feet of your most gracious Majesty, I humbly dedicate these works of my hands." shewing forth the afflictions of the of my people Israel unaddressed and unavenged. And that was the dedication uh, in the Haggadah to George of England, who received the first copy of the Haggadah. Um, wow. you know, uh, and so he, he whether, you know, why it was taken out like the swastikas itself, we're not really sure. Uh, but they but uh, that's a sort of maybe self-censorship just because of the pressure mm -hmm. of the publishers, the you know, it's still fresh when he's creating these swastikas on these paintings in the mid thirties, right? And even though it's published in 1940. So here's a question of the mid thirties because Joseph Levin asks, did he draw illustrations of Soviet communism's destruction of Jewish culture in the 1930s? And Alapinsky said, great question. So now we've got to answer, ask that or answer it. <laughs> did he? Uh, Steve, you want to shot, take a shot at that? I'm not sure what to say. You Just have to unmute yourself, Steve. I'm not aware that he did anything, any attacks on the Soviet Union regarding the uh, um, the crackdown on Hebrew and and uh, re and uh, religion in Russia. But he certainly was in his early years. You know, he fought against the, the Soviet troops. You know, you and was head of a propaganda unit in Poland that was fighting against the Soviet Union in, in 1920. So, and even his, in 1939, he did images of the, of the Soviets that were negative, you know, that, uh, that showed them as an ally of Nazi Germany. You know, of course, during the, the war years that changed as the Soviet Union became an ally of the, of the uh, United States and Great Britain. But he, you know, even here, he was critical of, of the Soviet Union. You know, at, at following World War I in 1919, 1920, uh, when Poland was at war against the Soviet Union, you know, Schick became the director of art propaganda for Poland in its war against the Soviet Union. Now, pause for a moment. A Jew, the head of Polish propaganda. Love it. But, and, and of course, he created a, a, an important work of art with uh, Julia Tuvim, which was uh, called Revolution in Germany in 1919, which he showed the influence and impact of the ills of, 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 of Soviet society, you know, on Polish, on, on Polish society. So he had, he knew what, who the Soviet Union was, but again, as the war progressed, and of course in 1939, he's doing drawings attacking uh, Russia. Um, there's a one picture in, in the New Order that Steve pointed out of uh, the book where the Polish soldiers in the center and Germany's attacking this way, uh, uh, Russia's attacking this way, the good neighbors, you know. Um, and so in the early days, of course, he, you know, but like everyone else, you know, the wins yeah. against the Soviet Union changed with the American allies. It's interesting, he died in 1951. The Cold War is really heating up. We're getting toward McCarthy and all of that business. And it would be interesting to uh, speculate, which we won't, on where his art would have gone in the next five years, you know, through the Rosenberg trial, all of that biz. But I have three quick questions which will barely get us through our last minute. One, did he work with uh, other cartoonists, someone asked. Two, did he and Norman Rockwell know each other? And three, did he have any problems getting a visa to come to the United States? So as quickly as you can, uh, parse those three, either of you or both of you, go for it. Steve? Uh well, did he work with other, certainly I think he knew other cartoonists and certainly he gave advice to other cartoonists. I, I was reading Art Wood's uh, autobiography and he talks about, he, I think he was in high school maybe and Art Wood became a, a, a noted cartoonist, but he talks about how he met, you know, Schick 
and Schick gave him advice. He talks about going to a Washington, D.C. gallery, and he sees huh. this man getting up close to one of these cartoons, and he says, hey, be careful. <laughs> and it turns around, it's Arthur Schick, you know? And so they developed this friendship, and he became, and later he collected Arthur Schick's work. But Schick gave him a lot of advice on, you know, sometimes with critical advice on how to become a cartoonist. And what about Rockwell? And, that I don't know. Uh, I I don't know if if they were friends or they knew each other. Uh -huh. Regarding his visa, I'm sure that both Great Britain and and uh, the Polish government in exile helped him get into the into the uh, into Canada first, and then into the United States. Uh, Last words, Earth. Yeah. So, so at, first of all, I'm sure Rockwell and Schick knew of of each other. Every everyone in New York knew Schick, and if you looked at the the the, the gallery books that people would sign as they go, you'd see artists' names who were coming to his gallery exhibitions in New York. Um, dozens and dozens of them that were held in the, the Warriors. Uh, Schick was mentioning about. Uh, I mean, Steve was mentioning about advice to artists. Uh, maybe it's this is a a, a a light sort of story to to close on. Uh, there's an article that appears that was written in a high school newspaper by a, uh, a young student who went to visit Arthur Schick. And uh, um, he went to interview him, you know, again, for the school newspaper. And Schick asked him um, if he ever uh, drew anything. And the, and the young boy, uh, or the high school student, pulled out a work of art and he showed it to Arthur Schick, to which Arthur Schick responded, um, did you ever think about of becoming a plumber? <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and then, then then Chick pulled him aside, I guess, and he put his arm over his shoulder. Listen, I'm envisioning this, that he put his arm over his shoulder. He says, look, I have one piece of advice for you. Um, why don't you go and sit down and, and, and go outside, pick a tree that you like, and sit down and draw a picture of that tree more than 100 times. And after you are finished drawing that tree, no one will be able to confuse that tree with any other tree. That was the way Schick was in his art. Nobody will ever confuse Schick with any other artist, but no one will ever confuse his message that what he wanted to deliver to the American public or to the European press or to the European public, he was absolutely quite clear on what he wanted to do. This was a man who was a citizen of the world. This was a man who was a devoted Jew, an American patriot, a Polish patriot to a large degree. And this was a man who, who, who believed in the essence of humanity and always worked for the elevation of the prestige of the Jew in the world and, and his fellow man. I mean, what greater tribute to a, right. to a man that we can pay? And uh, it's such a privilege to be able to do that. Well, with you. I couldn't have scripted a, a better concluding series of remarks to this session. I thank the, both of you for just being spectacular. And uh, as to the question that a number of people asked, yes, this has been recorded. It will become available. I think it will be at least a week from now. Rachel Stern is currently in Germany. When she gets back, that's her bailiwick. If I try and deal with that, you'll end up with gibberish. So uh, be patient, but yes, this will be available uh, as all of the Fritz Asher Society sessions uh, are available. And thank you all so very much for coming and thank the two of you so very much for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us all. See you all. Bye.